Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that we don't have to win battles ourselves, Lord, but the battle belongs to you. And so, Lord, we pray today that as we preach the word of God, that, Lord, you speak to each and every heart. If there's anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, then it's our prayer that today the Holy Spirit will draw them to salvation, and today would be the day of salvation. We pray today that we'll all become more like Jesus as having been in your presence and had your word preached. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We've been preaching through the uh, third chapter of Colossians, and so this morning we're going to continue that. Colossians chapter 3, we'll be looking in verses 12 through 17. The title of the message this morning is New Hearts Growing Together. The theme of this whole chapter is growing spiritually and growing towards spiritual maturity. And so this morning we've found our way to chapter 3, verse 12. And so let me read that for you. So, as those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. New hearts growing together. Uh, the esteemed scientist Albert Einstein was once d uh, dining with his next door neighbor's daughter. And the young girl asked uh, Mr. Einstein, she said, what is it you actually do? And he said, well, I have spent my life studying physics. And she said, huh, that's funny. I finished that my sophomore year. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes we approach our spiritual life that way. We, we get baptized, we join the church or whatever we do, and we say, well, I finished the course. Well, Winston Churchill told the uh, British people, he said, this is not the beginning, this is not the end. It's not even the uh, beginning of the end. It's just the end of the beginning. And so sometimes what we do is we start off our Christian life and we get the beginning things done and we stop at the beginning when actually it's just the end of the beginning. Spiritual growth is a lifelong endeavor and we never actually graduate from the school of discipleship. Uh, and so it's the same way with our spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. We never really arrive. We're always in process. We're constantly learning and growing. As we grow spiritually, what we discover is that our lessons are a series of sacrifices and decisions. Usually, spiritual growth involves deferring our will to the will of other people. It has to do with forgiving, with forbearing, and loving one another. The, the thing about spiritual growth is victorious living is the result of spiritual maturity. People want to be victorious. They want to walk with some sort of confidence in their life. But oftentimes we want to avoid the hard lessons that teach us how to get there. As we become more Christ-like, what happens in our life is, is we become able to love others more deeply. Not only that, the more mature we come spiritually, the stronger we stand against the storms of life. And so spiritual maturity is, is very important. And growing towards spiritual maturity occurs within the context of the body of Christ. Let me say that again. Growing in spiritual maturity occurs within the context of the body of Christ. 
we never grow alone. We grow together. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The central truth of this message is Christians grow spiritually together. We grow spiritually together. Now, in this passage, I want you to see the first truth is all Christians have new identities. All Christians have new identities. Last week, we looked at the previous verses and we looked at the first thing that uh, we said was, or one of the things we said was, that we need to drop our previous labels. We need to drop the labels that identified us prior to our salvation. Notice what they were in verse 11. Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all and in all. And we said that this racial problem that we are experiencing and have experienced since the dawn of time, the only solution to it is for those people who are saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ need to take their racism and nail it to the cross and let it die there and be new people in Christ. Amen. And so we have new identities. And so he gives us what our new labels are. Did you notice that? He says followers of Christ have new labels. And uh, in verse 12, he tells us what they are. Number one is we are chosen by God. That's our label. We are chosen by God. Now the word chosen is also translated in other places as elect. The doctrine or the teaching of election gives some people fits. Uh, the doctrine of election simply means that God takes the initiative in salvation. God takes the initiative. Election means that God chooses or elects to save people. The doctrine of election means that unless God took the initiative and acted upon the heart, no person would or could be saved. The doctrine of election gives all the glory to God and takes any glory away from man. People try to take credit, but they can't claim credit because no one is worthy of salvation. God chose to save people. The doctrine of election is that God chose to send his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to die on an old rugged cross so that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The doctrine of election gives people fits because people try to rationalize it and they try to understand it from a human perspective. People reason sometimes that if God chooses people and then some people are not saved, then it stands to reason that God did not choose to save those people. They further rationalize that if God did not choose to save that particular person, then it must be that God chose to send that person to hell. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible plainly says in multiple passages, but in one passage in particular, 2 Timothy 2, 4, God desires all men or all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So somebody says, well, which is it? Does God choose people to be saved or do people choose to be saved? The answer is yes. <laughs> And if you try to explain it any further than that, you'll run yourself ragged. The mystery of divine election, I cannot explain. The passage says that Christians are chosen by God, meaning that Christians are God's choice people, if you will. The gospel invitation goes forth, and all who turn to Christ in repentance and faith become God's chosen people. Once a person is saved, that person is not who they were prior to Christ, but the old person is dead and a new person is created in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the image of Christ. And so uh, all saved people have new identities and we have new titles, but that's not all. Not only are we chosen, but we're also holy. Notice what it said. He says, those who've been chosen by God, holy. Holy is your new title. 
Now, I'm not going to make you do like some preachers. I, I, I wanted to make you say out loud, I am holy, but I'm not going to do you that way. But just know that that's your new title. You are holy. In, in, uh, the word holy is also translated as saint. Somebody said, well, I'm not a saint. Well, if you're not a saint, you ain't saved. Because anybody that's saved is a saint. It's also, uh, the word holy is translated sanctify or consecrate. Consecrate. The basic meaning of holy or sanctified simply means set apart for God's purpose. Set apart for God's purpose. You may remember if you've studied the Old Testament, in the temple they had a lot of utensils that were holy utensils. What that meant was is they were holy, they were set apart to only be used in the service of God. They were never to be profaned. They were never to be used in some sort of secular, mundane, everyday way. They were set apart for God. And so as God's chosen people, we are set apart because our old person, our old man was crucified and now we've been resurrected in Christ. We are set apart from the world. We are God's select people. We are set apart from being profane and acting like the world that surrounds us. We should think of ourselves in this way. We need to start thinking about that I am a new creature in Christ. And that doesn't mean we go around with a holier than thou attitude, uh, looking down our nose and snubbing people. It just means that we understand that we are to be used by God. That's our purpose. Uh, we're not just a bunch of sinners who traipse down the church aisle somewhere to get our spiritual fire insurance. We have been set apart. We are consecrated. We have new hearts, and our new hearts enable us to live like Jesus. The Christian is not trying to become holy. A Christian is a holy person who is growing in holiness. I want to say that again. That was so good. A Christian is not somebody who's trying to become holy. A Christian is somebody who is growing in their holiness. And so we are chosen and holy. That's our titles. But we got a third title. Beloved. Beloved. You see that? Holy and beloved. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, the Apostle Paul writes almost the same thing. He just puts it in a different way. He says there, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, Beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Prior to salvation, before anybody got saved, before we come to Jesus, before God saved us, we were not God's special people. We were characterized as being children of wrath. Listen to what the Bible says. Ephesians 2 verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath. That was our titles prior to salvation. Dead, sons of disobedience, children of wrath, but that's not all. Titus chapter three, verse three, the apostle writes there, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. There, there, there's a, there's a frank, famous Greek word, agape. Agape, uh, it, it means the deepest form of unconditional love. God agapes us. Beloved, we are God's agape. We are beloved by God. And in Christ, we're redeemed, set apart. We're no longer what we used to be. And it's all because of God's grace. 
And the Bible says in this book that I'm preaching from, Colossians 1.13, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. God did that for us. And it was not because we were so lovable. God didn't look down and say, hey, look, Steve's doing something good. I think now I'll save him. That's not why God saved us. God didn't save us because we were such outstanding people. We didn't get ourselves so good that God said, okay, now they're worth saving. It's by grace and grace alone. God is and was under no obligation to save anyone. God didn't have to save anybody. God chose to save us. He sent his only begotten son into this world. He draws us to himself by his Holy Spirit that we might be saved. And therefore, once a person is saved, they are set apart, rescued from the domain of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. And now we are the beloved of God. That's better than being anything else this world's got to offer. Some of y'all awake out there this morning. I got one person that's awake. Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen, here's the truth. It is imperative. Here's the point. Are you listening? If you say, I, I, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. All right. It is imperative that we believe and continually believe that we are new people in Christ so that we can act like it. Amen. See, you got to start telling yourself that you are what God says you are. You got to start telling yourself, not just once, not just twice, all day long you need to tell yourself that you are what God calls you to be. And it'll change your behavior. It'll change your outlook. It'll change the way you interact with other people. And that brings us to the second point. Christians are to practice new behaviors from their new heart. You're supposed to practice new behavior because you have a new heart. Notice in this paragraph that I read, verses 12 through 17, three times Paul makes emphasis of the heart. The heart. The heart. Notice that. Verse 12. He says, put on a heart of compassion. Verse 15, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And then in verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell with, dwell with you with thankfulness in your hearts. In order to grow spiritually and grow towards spiritual maturity, our behaviors have to be regulated from the heart that is filled with the Spirit of God. The heart, the heart is the control center of life. The heart regulates our choices. The heart determines our behavior, prioritizes our desires, and it is our heart that guides our life. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it flows the spring of life. That means your heart's regulating everything that's going on in your life. Jesus said it this way, Luke 6, 45. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. You want to know what's in somebody's heart? Listen to what they say. They'll tell you what's in their heart. And so I want you to see two or three points here. Uh, I, 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 Christians need to practice new behaviors from their heart. We need to put on new behavior, new heart behavior towards others. We need to put on new heart behavior towards others. If we are, and we are as God's people, chosen, holy, beloved children of God, then we have a new heart. The word put on indicates a decision, a choice, something that you must think about doing. For example, 
just about every single day, especially in the wintertime. One of the things I do before I even eat breakfast is I check the weather forecast. The reason being is I want to know what I need to put on before I go outside. Because I wouldn't want to put on a tank top when it's 12 degrees outside. <laughs> that would be a foolish way to dress. So I think about what I'm going to encounter that day and therefore I dress appropriately and I dress for warmth, okay? Or for cool, depending on the season. We put on a new heart. We survey the landscape and we decide to put on new heart behaviors today. Now, these behaviors that he lists, uh, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, notice those. Those behaviors have to deal with how we behave towards other people. Now understand something. Those behaviors are not conditioned on how other people behave towards us. I'll say that again. Those behaviors come from our new heart. They are not based on how other people behave towards us. You see, that's the way a lot of people live their life. They say, well, if you do me wrong, I'm going to do you wrong. If you say something bad to me, I'm going to say something bad to you. You cut me off on the road, I'm going to blast you back. Yeah, I mean, it's always tit for tat. That's why our world's in chaos. He didn't say, you need to act these ways because you got a new heart. In other words, the Bible does not say, if other people are kind, then you be kind. It doesn't say, if other people are humble and patient, then you be patient. The condition principle is because you have been chosen and are holy and are beloved and a new person in Christ, then you are to forgive and to forbear with one another. And then he goes and tells us the length and the breadth and the completeness to which we are to go with these behaviors. Notice that. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. How far do you have to go in these behaviors? Well, let me ask you this. The Lord Jesus Christ stretched out his arms and had nails and, and, and a crown of thorn. And with his last breath, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's how far. Wow. You say, I can't do that. You're right. But Christ in you can do that. You see? And so we have new identities. And now we have a new heart. And it is our Christ-like heart that enables us to act like Christ. Christ-like behavior is spiritual growth towards maturity. The second thing I want you to see is, not only are we supposed to put on a new heart behavior towards others, but we are to allow our new hearts to lead us farther. Notice what he says in verse 14. Don't just let this slip by here. He just said, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And in verse 14, beyond all these things. <laughs> Go farther. Go farther. Beyond all these things. In other words, don't stay satisfied with where you are spiritually, but keep striving and keep growing and keep loving. Keep becoming more like Christ. Don't get satisfied and just quit. A man after 25 years with one company, he was still doing the same old job and drawing the same salary. Finally, he went to his boss and he told him that he felt like he'd been neglected. After all, he said, I've had a quarter century experience. The boss said to him, my dear fellow, you haven't had a quarter century experience. You've had one experience for a quarter century. <laughs> well, see, just being a Christian and being a church member for 25 years does not make you a maturing Christian. You got to go farther. You got to go beyond. 
You got to keep striving. You got to keep reaching. If you want to grow towards spiritual maturity, we've learned that it's not through special revelations. It's not through rules and rituals. It's not through harsh discipline. It's through sacrificial love. He says, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love. What was that song? Love will keep us together. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a spiritual truth. Think about this. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ has every, every reason to be the most loving and most unified people on the planet. And it's only when we walk in the flesh is when that unity is destroyed. I think of two illustrations of unity. One is a uh, a sack filled with marbles. You take a paper sack and you fill it up with marbles and twist the top. You got, uh, all those marbles are in one place. Somebody could say they're unified because they're all in one place. But think about what happens if I take my finger and poke a hole in it and one marble squeezes through. Then another. And as that hole begins to widen, next thing you know, what happens to those marbles when the bag busts? They go their own separate ways. They weren't unified, they were just all in one place. But a better illustration of unity is water. You ever thought about water? How water continuously seeks out the larger body? For example, you can pour some water, a cup of water out on the sidewalk. What happens to it? Does it disappear? Yeah, it disappears, but it doesn't, doesn't vanquish, it doesn't go away. What it does, it distills and it gets in the clouds and collects up with more water and eventually rains on your parade. <laughs> but it collects, it seeks. You can pour water out the top of a hill and it may spread up, but eventually it gets back together. Water always seeks its own. Water seeks to unify. And that's the way Christians are. We ought to crave one another. We ought to long for one another. We ought to love one another. The Bible says in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Christians cannot be ambivalent or indifferent about loving others. If we intend to grow spiritually towards maturity, we will put on, that is, we will choose to love and stay united with our fellow believers in the body of Christ because we grow together. And so we got to go farther. And then the final thing is, allow your communication to flow from your new heart. Allow your communications to flow from your new heart. Notice what he says in verse 15. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Then he addresses how Christians who have the peace of Christ ruling in their hearts communicate with one another. He says, let the word of Christ dwell within you richly or richly dwell within you, verse 16. That is, Christ dwells in our heart. He teaches us. Once we learn from him, then we teach others. What do we teach? And how do we teach? Admonishing one another. Admonishing means to warn. Now, we warn one another in love. It's just like a mother would warn her child to stay away from a hot stove or to stay out of the road. You don't, you don't do it haughty or arrogantly. You, you, you love one another, so you warn one another. And then he says to use uh, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. He lists three kinds of songs because he wants to include all types of singing. Types of singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I'm glad that we got through the 90s. I can't believe it's already 2021. I remember looking forward to the 90s thinking that was going to be a new, new time. Now we look back and we think, wow, uh, that was the time. Uh, back in the 90s, all pastors of Southern Baptist Church endured what has been affectionately called the worship wars. 
the worship wars. What that was was during that time, musical styles and preferences were changing in churches. Some were thrilled. Others were outraged. When I first started pastoring and preaching, every Baptist church in the county was identical. Every Baptist church all across America was the same. Oh, you might have had different color carpet or uh, paneling or, or, or different. But basically it was the same. When you went in the sanctuary, they had a pulpit in the middle. Usually on the right-hand side you had a piano and on the left-hand side you had an organ. Well, they might have switched them, but on one side you had a piano and one side you had an organ. And they used one book, the Baptist hymnal. Yes. That's what we had. Now, the more sanctified had the Broadman hymnal, but I won't go there. Some of y'all laughing and showing your age. I know how you are. But every church, every church had a choir. Had a choir, choir robes. If you was a poor country church, you got the hand-me-down robes from the town church and you wore them proudly on Sunday morning. And they had choir practice on Wednesday night. And everything was very much orderly and in, in and sometime in the 90s, somebody brought a set of drums to church. <laughs> and some people were thrilled. And some people, some people yelled blasphemy and walked out. Now, don't amen that, all right? But as a pastoral observer of those times, I saw people from both camps act exceedingly unlovingly and immaturely. You see, both groups claimed to own the spiritual high ground in that argument. We'll call them the traditionalists. The traditionalist group claimed they had superiority because they were more reverent and more respectful. And there was something to be said for that. The contemporary group, on the other hand, claimed superiority because they said, we're fresh. We're following the Spirit. And there was something to be said for that. But both sides acted like brats. I remember uh, one Sunday morning while I was pastoring over in Virginia, uh, before the service, uh, we had a guest come in, the church. Uh, and he came up to me and he introduced himself, a kind fellow, very nice. And he said to me, he said, uh, does this church sing praise music? I said, we praise the Lord every Sunday in this church. Well, I knew what he was getting at, but I was trying to kind of evade the question. He said, what I mean is, does this church have a praise band? I said, sir, we glorify the Lord Jesus and we uplift the people and we do the best we can. He said, well, I'm leaving. I can't worship in a church that sings them old hymns. And I thought, well, I'm glad you're leaving. <laughs> Sometimes I have unspiritual thoughts, you see. And time to confess. I thought that was somewhat arrogant. I visited, Cindy and I visited another church and uh, we were, I don't know if we were on vacation or with some relatives or something, but we noticed something very strange. They had a call to worship and then they had their morning prayer. They gave a few announcements. And as soon as the announcements were finished, the worship leader got up and said, I'm gonna lead y'all in a praise chorus. At that point, some of the people in the church stood up, exited to a side room and I later found out they were there praying to cast the demons of the drums out of the church. <laughs> now we look back on that today and we're laughing about it. But it split churches up back then. And in both cases, the contemporary or the traditionalist, you know what the problem was? The problem is they both had the same problem. Both sides thought the worship was 
about their own pleasure and they were acting out of spiritual immaturity and not walking in love. Amen. The central truth of this passage is Christians grow spiritually together. Notice those behaviors. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, forgiving as Christ forgave you, communicating with love with thanksgiving in your heart. All these behaviors involve interacting with other people within the context of the body of Christ. And those behaviors are the behaviors of people with new hearts. It was during those days of the worship wars. We were visiting our relatives over in Arkansas, Cindy and I were. And it, I remember it was a, it was one of them cold December Arkansas Ozark Mountain Nights. If you've never been there, it's gloomy. It's cold. And they were having a Sunday evening service at the church where Cindy's, Cindy's home church, and they told us it was going to be a, a uh, now in Arkansas they don't have singings, they have singings, okay? It's going to be singing. And so, out of duty and obligation, we went. I remember pulling in the parking lot, Cindy's dad, who never criticized anybody, he said, oh no, there he is, and he's got that guitar. <laughs> well, what, what, what is it, Earl? Well, the guy can't even talk, but every time we have one of these singings, he drags that electric guitar out, puts that amplifier out, and just makes the awfulest racket you ever heard. Well... All right, so we went in the church, and we sat down. And the old boy did. Uh, after two or three other people sang, he got up there. And I'm not making fun of him, but he said a few words, and I can't tell you what he said when he got through talking. He, he had some sort of speech impediment. You couldn't understand him. And he had no voice to sing, and he had no talent to play. But he turned that amplifier up and he went to pecking on that thing. But the only thing that you could really understand that he said was, oh, precious Jesus. Oh, precious Jesus. And you see, something changed about halfway through that song. Because that old man had been saved out of a horrible lifestyle. And he gave God the glory that he could give him. By the end of that song, I looked over and seen his daddy just cried to drop a hat. Tears were rolling down his eyes. And I thought to myself, we've all learned something here tonight. We've all learned something here tonight. You see, Christians grow together. We grow spiritually together. We grow together with all of our warts, with all of our failures, and all of our imperfections because we have a new heart and we're becoming like Christ. And spiritual growth all begins with spiritual birth. This morning I would just ask you, has there ever been a time in your life when you look back and say, I've received the Lord Jesus. I repented of my sins and I trusted Jesus as my Savior and Lord. And that started my spiritual journey with God through Christ. If you want to be saved this morning and never have been saved, then in just a few moments we're going to begin to sing an invitation song. And uh, I'm going to ask you to just come forward. Pastor Eric will be here. I'll be here. So maybe some of our deacons will be here. We'll pray with you and we'll even talk to you after the service. But don't leave without having Jesus as your Savior. And then this morning, spiritual victory comes by way of spiritual maturity. You don't, you don't take a single course and graduate and then go on about your life. It's something you practice out of your new heart amongst the beloved people of God. Spiritual growth happens within the context of the body of Christ. And so maybe this morning God's laid on your heart to become active 
in the body of Christ. Maybe God wants you to place membership and get committed to Southern Calvert Baptist Church. If that's what God's laying on your heart, we would be thrilled. Maybe it's something as simple as daily commit to read the Word of God. Whatever it is, would you be obedient to the Spirit of God? Would you stand with me? Bow your heads, close your eyes as I lead us in prayer. As our praise team comes forward. If you want to be saved, won't you just step right on out? If you want to make a commitment, won't you come? Father, in Jesus' name we pray that you'd help us all to grow from our new hearts. And we would be the kind of people you've called us to be. Use this invitation, we pray, for the glory of Christ. For it's in his name I pray. Amen.